I'm a simple professor of fine arts. The only thing I know that I was always somehow drawing. You can't read the paintings if you don't know all the background stories. This was right at that point where you are beyond reality, actually. I felt right, quite right. There's a high level of empathy on mm -hmm. the new generation. You're always exposed to um, the beauty of the light. Woof woof. Welcome to Ghanacast. Today I'm speaking to Christian Markdans, who is an artist and a professor of fine arts at the University of Dresden. Christian is also a heartfulness meditation practitioner and trainer. Christian, it's wonderful to have you here in the Ghana studio. I feel like a bit of a paparazzo having chased you <laughs> and almost forced you to come into the studio. But, uh, you know, it's just wonderful to have you. Just yeah. two days before you left. You almost got away, Christian. Yeah, I nearly managed to escape. <laughs> but your heart is too big and too um, pulling, so I couldn't resist to be here. Well, that is too sweet of you to say. <laughs> no. But it's lovely to have you here, Christian. And I know that your uh, your official designation is you're the director at Dresden, director of the arts faculty. No, I'm a simple professor of fine arts. Okay. Um, in the University of Fine Arts in Dresden. Dresden. And <clears throat> I have been dean. I have been uh, vice president. But it's over now. I'm just a simple <laughs> okay <laughs> professor. That's all. But uh, have you always been in Dresden? Have you grown up in Dresden, or was your no. childhood somewhere else? No, I'm. Um, I was I'm growing up in uh, northern Germany, uh, close to the Baltic Sea, and then uh, grown up there till 19, and then I moved to Vienna to study uh, art at the Uni University of Fine Arts in Dresden, uh, in in Vienna. In Vienna, yes. okay. Austria okay. must have been extremely cold. Northern Germany must be very cold and. It's it's cold. It's windy. It's uh, you know there's this influence of the two oceans. You have the northern sea, which yes, is yes, close yes. to Atlantic. Yes, <clears throat> and the, you have the Baltic Sea, which can be very cold, uh, but it's always a per particular light. You're always exposed to um, the beauty of the light mm -hmm. from the east and from the west. Yeah, and the smell of the sea and the wind. It's nice actually, but I. I'm happy to be not anymore there. <laughs> <laughs> so was this a big city that you were growing up in or a small town? Or? It was a, in the first years very much on countryside. Okay. Really rural. And I remember that I have some um, remembrance that we didn't have even water uh, in our house because it was really an old, very old farmhouse. So no running water. No running water. After one year we got it. Okay. And uh, so that was, but it was beautiful because we were in the middle of nature. And for instance, for my brother and me, my elder brother and me, we had, <clears throat> there were, we only were exposed to animals, cows, wow. uh, mm. our, our ducks and gooses. <laughs> and I remember that we, we just um, imitated the cows eating grass. <laughs> <laughs> so this was beautiful, beautiful first years. And then we moved to, smaller town but on the edge so we were always uh, in the woods and in the forests and in the fields wow and um, uh, your father your parents were this was farmsteading farmsteading was that no it's um my father was um, my parents are refugees okay so they lost everything uh, in the end of the second world war and they were refugees and um my father had difficulties because he was from an old uh, landlord farmer. Oh, family. aristocratic family. Oh. Yeah, yeah, hmm. part of. And so they 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 lost everything, and um, so he was not because he was very attached to his uh, land. So when he was talking of home, it, it was, was that. Land. Yeah, it was that. So when we were sitting at the table and he was talking at home, it was not the place where we are actually. Wow. So this was. Um, his destiny and and um, uh, he um, after some years of f trying to find a work he he, uh, he became an officer in the army okay and th this your family must have been uh, at that estate for a while I mean uh, the one that they lost because if your father was so attached to it it must have been he must have grown up there pretty much he grew up there yes but yeah. he lo they lost everything and, and it was the end of, I mean brutal times here right so um, 
part of the family. They're all gone in this last month in the mm-hmm. Second World War. It's German history or European history, actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in that time, in that uh, rural uh, setting, mm. uh, when did you first discover you were interested in art? Um, actually, I cannot really say. The only thing I know that I was always somehow drawing. <clears throat> and I remember that, you know, this uh, photo books my mother used to do to shoot photos and very nicely put them on this black uh, cartoon paper and, you know, black and white photos at that time. And with white uh, ink, she was writing um, our little boy, <laughs> our little artist boy, always with a cap <laughs> and a pencil. <laughs> so it must be very early, actually. I think uh, I was always uh, drawing. Wow. And uh, any of your siblings? How many siblings were you? I have one brother. One brother. brother. Uh, He was not interested in art that much. No. Okay. So how did you take this further? When did you realize that art was going to be your career? Um, I was very much supported by my grandmother because she studied art in the 20s, Mm -hmm. 30s. and uh, when she saw that I was always drawing and uh, drawing and um, mm, using paper and pencil, she actually she started to gifted me for birthdays and Christmas uh, all the material. So when I was twelve, I started to do some oil paintings because this was my birthday uh, presents and and I got my first artist books. You know all these French painters. Uh, impressionist and so I don't know it was for everybody it was clear that I would do some art Mm -hmm. later on Mm -hmm. and um, where was there any sort of interest in uh, spirituality at that time religion what was that in the family like was there any religious I mean did you go to church or some any of that Mm, no we were I mean you know like this normal families uh, they are not. They are somehow religious, but they don't practice actually. But um, there are two things actually. My grandmother, she's coming from a, a, a family where they are a Protestant. Um, uh, her father was a priest, Protestant okay. priest, okay. and a professor of a, re- a religion. And um, when I was sixteen, she gifted me the family Bible. So out of curiosity and out of the fact that a lot of European painting and art uh, is related to the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, uh, you know, you can't read the paintings if you don't know all these background stories. Sure. So I started to um, read the Bible, actually, three, four times. <laughs> so because I was so curious about it. And uh, and I liked the stories and I liked the, you know, the twists and the, the, the um, how shall I say, the the way which God is finding um, to uh, make his um, his chosen people uh, coming to their to their final goal. It's a beautiful way, actually. But it's also very cruel, and mm-hmm. and, and I'm n- not really attached to that religion. But it was for me. It was a good moment to at least to get some insight into uh, religi- our religious background. But spirituality is not that. Spirituality, I would say, my mother, she was quite modern at that time, and she took me always to yoga courses. And the yoga courses, I I was just, you know, sitting around. But then afterwards, we were meditating, kind of meditating, very close to the uh, to a, a relaxation practice. Which years would this be, I mean, approximately? In the 70s. 70s. I was maybe something like, I don't know, eight, nine Ten, maybe. Mm-hmm. So yoga studios were fairly common at that time. In? Yeah, because you know uh, it was the time post '68 generation. Mm-hmm. So um, my mother became a teacher at that time. She, so she was studying, and there was the influence of this generation who already were very fond of Indian culture, yoga, meditation, and all that. So actually, the, the influence was there, and I remember also to have a. I have it in my um, children's room, a poster uh, of, uh, you know, like the 
70s smoking a hookah <laughs> <laughs> and some beautiful uh, text about love and peace. <laughs> I remember that and th that was influencing me. And particularly actually this um, last moment in the yoga course when we were relaxing or meditating, I always feel like this is this is it, you know, because mm -hmm. it felt like dying actually. I, I translated this particular exercise like, okay, this is the dying uh, exercise. Wow. And I liked it. <laughs> I think it, when you are a child, you're not so afraid of death. Sure, sure. And you were how old at that time? You were six, seven. Six, seven. Oh, yeah, wow. Eight, maybe nine, nine. And uh, you were there uh, with the, along with your mother in these yoga courses. Yeah. Wow, wow. And then when you got into university, I guess you majored in art then, and you moved to a different town. Yeah, I moved to Vienna in Austria. You, you moved to Vienna. How was how was it there? How was the was there was it difficult to adjust to sudden, suddenly a very cosmopolitan life? Um, no, at that time actually, I was really longing to leave um, the northern part of Germany because mm -hmm. it's it's a bit rural, and it's um, it's not really art. Um, there's not much art, contemporary art. Mm -hmm. At that time, there was none actually. So you wanted to expand your horizons, and yeah, yeah. I wanted to really study art, and and I pushed very hard, and also I was very, let's say, eager, um, because I knew that um, I have to live on it. So I, I um, for me, it was important to find a good place to study art, and Vienna was a very good place at that time, still is, and. Um, but when at that time it was in the 83 84 vienna was quite um old fashioned so the the if you if you, if you check uh, uh, in the web now for instance vienna is very modern very open uh, at that time it was more uh, a city of um old people and dogs <laughs> <laughs> very few young people actually so but that changed in this ex ex actually exactly in this years of the 80s there was a movement where it opened up, kind yeah. of. So, I mean, uh, you have that uh, stereotype of the penniless artist, you know, the artist is not, uh, it does, does not earn as much as, uh, say, other professions would do. Was there, was there ever a fear or a pressure that I have really got to make this work? Um, yeah, in the beginning, um, I felt this pressure that I would really, I, I wanted to study hard. I really wanted to study hard, and which I did. And then, for some reason, I had the opportunity also through some good friends who who were also um, convinced about my my work. Uh, I could quite early start. To, I started quite early to sell paintings, mm -hmm. and um, so when I started to sell paintings. Um, I realized, oh, it's not so difficult, and money is not important. This is like a double <laughs> experience <laughs> because you know I was something like 24 or maybe 25, I don't know, and I had an exhibition and I was hanging the paintings uh, because in the evening th there was the opening. It was just a you know a small gallery for students, and while I was hanging, there was coming a, a gallerist, and he said there were 17 paintings. I remember that, and then he said. Okay, I buy all the 17 paintings for this and this amount, very little. And you decide if you want to sell it and I will come uh, uh, a quarter an hour before the exhibition is opening and you tell me if, you, if you're going to sell it because he wanted to have an exhibition a little later. Mm -hmm. So I was quite excited and then, um, but did the work, finishing the hanging of the exhibition. <clears throat> and then I was walking around Vienna and thinking, okay, what, I, what I'm going to do? And then I decided, okay, I sell everything. Because at that time I thought, okay, I have 17 paintings, which I can, okay, uh, I stand for. Uh, what if I would not have any more <laughs> in the future? So actually I decided, okay, no. Now you become professional, you sell it, and the next 17 will be good, good, fine too. So I decided to sell it, and in the evening he gave me the money. And the next morning I went to buy for somebody I really liked, uh, a huge um, 
music uh, music box or something like this, you know, mm -hmm. with the, with the uh, CD player and oh, radio okay. and this, I don't know how you say it in English. Oh, one well, of those uh, record players. Uh, yeah, the big one. You the know, gramophone type. Yeah, thing. something like oh, this, okay. exactly. Yeah. One third, then I, I bought a suit of, of cashmere wool oh, wow. <laughs> for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and in the evening, I invited my friends for, for dinner. And uh, at that moment, uh, so the one third of the money was gone for the gift. Yes. One third for the cashmere suit. suit. <laughs> One third, I was at that evening when I invited my friends. Somebody stole the money. <laughs> so wow! <laughs> within 24 hours, I lost all the money. And so somebody at the party stole the money. It was in the restaurant. It was in the restaurant. Oh. Somebody from outside. Wow! But what I wanted to say is, uh, I was just laughing. <laughs> I don't know. I was. This is, was like a story of the Bible for me. <laughs> you know, this was. It was a story. So for me, money. I never really. It never was a no. uh, that important, that big a deal for no. you. Wow. Coming to your approach to art, you said you studied very hard. Yeah. You studied uh, art. Uh, you know, a lot of people have this idea that art is all about being inspired and being uh, inspiration. But how much of study is involved? Of course, the inspiration is there, but. Uh, if for, for you personally, how much is it about the study and how much is it about the inspiration? Hmm. Um, somebody said 95% work, study, and 5% inspiration. Genius. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, really, I don't know. I know that when I see also my students now, I, I, without inspiration, it's a bit boring from that part. Uh, but if you don't really study, and I'm, I mean with study, I don't, do not mean really that you uh, uh, learn the crafts. This is, you know, happening. It's just happening while doing, while experiencing. It's more about actually uh, experiencing and learning from your experience. You do something and look what is happening. Mm. And while you are doing, um, you're completely immersed in it. Maybe your inspiration is driving you, hopefully. But you're doing and afterwards you're sitting and watching what happened. And you're studying it and you have to think about it and you have to observe what you have done. Actually, it's, it's a, 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 I think it's a good work as work to widen your consciousness because you have to observe, you have to watch <clears throat> and when you for instance prepare an artwork you have also, you're also studying, observing, watching so it's a, it's a, the major part of, of the work is uh, not passive but in observing I would say before and afterwards so, and this is a learning part. And therefore, I would say studying is quite important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you have an inspiration and you have not the patience, you have not the skills, skills is coming automatically. It's not anymore like 50, 100 years back. So this is coming uh, along along the, the way, along the your personal um, street. I mean, you pick it up. You yeah, you pick it up, exactly. Okay. Okay. And uh, how much of it involved being uh, exposed to all sorts of art, being exposed to art happening in the world over? Did you explore many traditions, many, uh, you know, movements in art? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, till, let's say, late 90s, everything through books, traveling, museums, and um, then you know through the digital world you are more connected you can sure. uh, you can check everything uh, via all the search machines yeah uh, you can actually virtually walk through the louvre yes, and exactly. check out exactly <laughs> you know, there's that exactly so, so. that's quite um, it's good and bad of course but it's 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 very helpful actually and particularly now when you deal with the students it's it's very very helpful Absolutely. So what was your biggest sort of uh, artist that you looked up to or movements that you looked up to in art? What, what was your greatest influence? <laughs> um, 
I think a real revelation was uh, the exposure to the paintings of Giotto. You may know him. He's an uh, early, very early Renaissance, uh, Renaissance painter in Italy with his uh, wall paintings, frescoes, uh, because somehow he depicted the, the, the life of San Francesco. And I like I like San Francesco. I like his life. I like his, um, let's say, uh, turn in his life that he turned away from this, uh, from the material life and from the uh, ap actually capitalistic life mm -hmm. towards a spiritual life. And became a hermit and lived. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and the paintings are very extremely beautiful. Somehow, you could feel that Giotto, the painter. He he translated uh, uh, the beauty of San Francesco's life into painting, so he was maybe the m most important painter. And this painting around uh, um, the early Renaissance uh, movement. There's some more Masaggio. Nobody knows Masaggio, but he's <laughs> very important. For instance, <laughs> Pier della Francesca and some more. Wow! So uh, the Renaissance, yeah, the Renaissance painters were, yeah were the ones that uh, you really looked up to and admired. And yeah. Well, and so you're in art school, you've uh, studied art and you've started selling also. Where did your interest in meditation and particularly heartfulness come in? <clears throat> um, actually quite early while I was studying art mm -hmm. and um, Meditation, in this sense, I didn't know at that time. Uh, but I was much in nature, as I told you. Yes. And I felt in nature, when I was a young boy, I was always going after school with my dog into the fields and, and, and into the forest. And <clears throat> also in Vienna, while I was studying there, uh, I was always trying to escape town. Though I was looking to live in the city and the capital, but then I had this uh, urge to go into the forest to be in nature. And I never feel, felt alone in nature. I always felt quite comfortable. Uh, so saying this, um, there were some friends and uh, who were also studying art who were doing uh, heartfulness meditation at that time. And they told me, why don't you come? And then there was the... Uh, the guide at that time, uh, he was coming to Vienna. So this was Chariji, huh? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think eighty-seven or something. Okay. So I went there, and um, somebody gave a speech. Actually, an artist from Germany, Verena von Gagan. Steidler, okay. You may know her. Or you this may is uh, this is uh, Otto Steidler's uh, yes, wife. Exactly. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I know Verena. She's a famous photographer. An art photographer. Okay, yeah, and Otto was an architect. He was an architect, yeah. Hmm. Uh, and she ge delivered a speech. Um, I can't remember exactly, but she was speaking about Pranahuti transmission. <clears throat> and this uh, and the gentleman was sitting in the background, didn't speak at all. <clears throat> and then he conducted a meditation. And then this meditation, I was completely... Um, in the beginning, I thought, okay, transmission, it's a kind of um, energy exchange, maybe something, because she was talking about transmission and cleaning. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe there's an exchange of energy and he's cleaning our energies, something like that. Whatever you think when you hear something and not experiencing it, right? So when the uh, meditation started, this was a completely different experience. There was some something I was not expecting and so profound, deep and light that I really knew, wow, this is a different, um, this is a different um, level of um, energy, if mm. you want to say. It's not energy, but it's a, it was a different level of experience, totally different level of experience. Very light, r light in the sense of light, I mean, and light in the sense of light luminosity so uh, so I was eager to go there again in the evening because I knew there's another meditation and mm -hmm. went there and um, I was full of expectation for that meditation I wanted to have this experience you wanted to repeat the experience, repeat this experience. Yeah. so when I went into the, the meditation he, he started the meditation and um, I was surprised because it was not there it was darkness 
Mm. So I went deeper into my heart, still darker, no light, not nothing at all. <laughs> so in the meditation, I went deeper and deeper and deeper, and I couldn't find anything which I was experienced in the, uh, experiencing in the morning. So in the last minute, you know, just before he said, that's all, uh, I felt, wow, in this deepest darkness, there's something which is essentially the same like in the morning, but it's beyond light and darkness. This was my last thought, and I was extremely, with this experience, um, convinced. So this was, uh, because I felt, here you go and go and go, and this uh, um, this uh, spiritual uh, journey will never end, in a sense. Mm. Mm. And it was beyond this idea of light and darkness and dualities, which we are dealing a lot in art, right? So I felt, wow, this is what I'm really looking for. Yeah, because in art there is that contrast, right, that you are... Uh, yeah, uh, in life. Yes, certainly. And art is just an expression of life. And uh, did you think about that experience when you were six and seven, six or seven? Did you have, at that time, did you compare it in any way? in the yoga studio in the yoga studio when when i had this feeling of you know this exercise of dying <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry uh, actually um this was right beyond this was right at that point where you are beyond reality actually i felt right quite right that was the place to be well so and after that you started with the practice and you became no I didn't start at the moment because I was preparing my first individual exhibition mm -hmm. so um, and I was eager to do this I did a little uh, publication and it was important place it was a, a kind of project uh, space for uh, in a museum so quite good actually but in the evening when there was the opening um, Well, in between, there was half a year between this uh, first meditation and the exhibition. This one was in autumn, the other was in spring. In between, you did not uh, have any meditate. experience of... Uh, no. Yeah. So I just pre were preparing my artwork. Mm -hmm. But I, I, suddenly, I sometimes heard a kind of call, like, come. I don't know. Where. It was even in English. I don't know where it comes from. I, didn't, I couldn't put it anywhere. Anyway, this is in between. And then in the evening, in the moment when, you know, when there's an exhibition, somebody is opening it. So at that time, the German ambassador and uh, the director of the museum and some curator, they were delivering speeches. You know, there's uh, directors and whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt this will not be my life. This will not be, uh, the. this is not the focus of my life because I can be here now in Vienna. It can, at that time, New York was the center of art, mm -hmm. modern, uh, contemporary mm -hmm. art. It could be in, in, in New York. The people may change, but this is not, not to be, uh, this will not to be to my center and my focus in life. <clears throat> then I decided to meditate at that moment. Wow, so at your first art opening, yeah. you realized that this is not it yeah. for you. I mean. Uh, not not the fact that art is not it, but this whole milieu of art openings yeah. and, you know. So you needed, uh, you know, something else. Yeah, I knew it. Is, I, 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 at that moment, I knew I have to start the meditation regularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, you went ahead and did that. Yeah. And did your art, as you started to meditate, did that have an influence on your art as well? I think so. Um, first, you you have this different experiences in meditation. I was living at that time on countryside again, outside Vienna. So I was meditating in nature, and it's a beautiful experience. And, you know, suddenly a bird was sitting on my knee, but not in a park, somewhere on countryside, so the birds are not used to humans. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what I wanted to say, there are so many experiences in the meditation which, are, which you slowly learn to um, understand and to relate to and not maybe to be too attached to the experience itself. But in the beginning, uh, it's just um, very inspiring. So I'm pretty much sure that 
um, at that time, um, the meditation was inspiring a lot of the artwork. Wow. And uh, wh what was your relationship then with Chariji going forward? I mean, did you come to India immediately or after a few years or did he visit Europe often? Um, he came to Europe very often at that time. I I think two, three years later, I have been the first time in India. Um, and um, yeah, he was very often in India, but I had no personal relation to him. I was mm -hmm. something like a background. So meditator. what was that first trip to India like? I mean, that must have been because uh, yeah. never been to India, always uh, oh. Europe. And uh, yeah. so how was that? Oh, that was really something. I mean, uh, it was 1990. 1990. And, uh, you know, when you come out of the uh, conditioned, air conditioned uh, <laughs> airport in Mumbai uh, and the air was hot and uh, dusty and <laughs> uh, some odor, <laughs> it was like a shock physically, but my heart was, oh, I'm at home. So this is, was my uh, wow. entering India and this feeling remained actually. I mean, the feeling remained. <laughs> On all your in subsequent the, trips. Yeah. Yeah. I have been not very often uh, in the big, the first, I would say, uh, 15 years, I have not been very often in India. 1990, 1995, then 1990 again, and uh, then later on, uh, because I got some, due to this professorship, I had, had some regular income, I could come every year. Wow. So, what well, the first trip you came to Mumbai? Mumbai, there was Bazan Panchami. Okay, yeah. okay. And then we went to Bangalore. Mm -hmm. Bangalore was nice. I mean, I was sick for maybe 10 days, really sick. But uh, uh, in the end, it was a very beautiful stay there because an elder gentleman, and I'm very sorry that I've, I must check my old notes, my, my, my diaries, because I cannot recall his name now. I know only that he passed away. An elder gentleman from Chennai, he explained me on 18 evenings the 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita and the light of heartfulness. Wow. So every evening after satsang, we were sitting on the stairs before uh, dinner and he was giving a private lecture that was very beautiful. And I wow. was drawn into this um, relation between, I mean, this beautiful uh, relation between Arjuna and Lord Krishna. Wow. That was very beautiful. Wow. You know, a lot of uh, artists, they seem to uh, g get a lot of inspiration from pain in a way, from discomfort in the sense of uh, mental or physical, mental mostly. Mm. Yeah. You know, like the angst yeah. uh, gets to art. Uh, wa was that ever a motivation for you? Or it was always beauty. Um, no, not always beauty. I mean, this life has everything we know that we're mm. talking about dualities right yes yes so it's there and when you want to show beauty automatic i mean this is about harmony you cannot show beauty without uh something of the opposite it has to be integrated and um this is maybe very important to understand that in, in art you are dealing with the dualities spirituality is transcending dualities so th this is why art in a sense is just a, a mean to express life, and uh, but it's not spiritual. It can provoke spiritual feelings in somebody who is watching at art. And maybe if the artist has interest in spirituality or is humble enough to um, to dedicate his heart to something higher then um, maybe the art can express it, but it's n not a guarantee. <laughs> so it's, it's um, this is a side, your question was different, I know, no, I'm no. sorry. <laughs> no, no, but, but uh, this is uh, really illuminating. I mean, uh, because uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we hear stories of artists being consumed by their work in a way also. Yeah. Uh, but what you are saying is like, uh, you know, when you when you know that there is something beyond, and this is just a stage of that duality, 
you you have that safeguard you're not going to get consumed by your work and give it so much importance and then also the ego gets involved in a, in a way look i take it very ser- seriously the artwork mm. mm. and i'm i i'm really want to push forward my personal artwork and i i hoped also to to be a good uh, assistant to my students this is one thing uh, but um we have to put our, personally I, i for me it's very clear the from the first evening of the exhibition which i was referring earlier the art opening yes yeah it's the the object of life is very clear and art is on one hand it's just a work like a, any other work but on the other hand it's a beautiful work very beautiful work and it's a gift somehow because um in artwork you have a kind of um similar um approach like spirituality where you work with your consciousness so if you refine um your consciousness it has an in fact uh, impact directly uh, on on your spiritual life on your artwork and simultaneously when you refine your artwork um it's also something which is helping you to um, refine your consciousness this is why why it's a beauty but it's in the end just a work that's really interesting also um uh, as you were mentioning that the art can also have have an effect on your spiritual journey in a way uh, so while painting can you get into a state of say transcending ecstasy <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> transcending time and space and just the painting kind of painting itself in a way yeah this is something maybe uh, i shouldn't talk about it because it's quite intimate but um when i started meditation i knew that there's also a slight danger to lose a kind of feeling which i had while painting because when you paint after some days let's say you prepare an exhibition so you start working and you go deeper and deeper into the work and you you work days month every day for hours and you are really absorbed in the work um and there is a kind of state after some days where where i mean personally sometimes you hear some music which there's no music but something like s- celestial music that you say i think something like you know which is really a little bit like ecstasy like a ecstasy uh and when i started meditation i knew i don't know intuitively that this feeling is in danger <laughs> <laughs> and after maybe 9 years of meditation i was preparing an exhibition and working hard for that and really i was living in Ro- in rome italy that time so i was focused and after some days i felt something is different but i couldn't figure out what so i st- painted and then after some maybe 10 15 days 3 weeks i again felt what is different and then i realized this feeling is gone i would say this emotion is gone because mm. this ecstasy thing is just an emotion and i felt it's gone still i was painting and i felt i was even progressing so i have personally experienced that things you are afraid of letting go somehow they somebody takes them away when you are narcotized <laughs> when you don't when you don't feel it when you don't realize it so wow. it's um it's good yeah yeah because i mean uh, i'm sure poets and all fear that they will what if they had nothing to write about you know if that that state of nothingness uh, yeah. comes in <laughs> yeah but i never had this fear i just mm-hmm. had the feeling that this you know this particular i don't know feeling of listening to the angels singing or something like this <laughs> this will be uh this will go and it it's gone the other part of your life of course christian is uh, your teaching yeah. your uh, teaching of art how rewarding do you find that what what is the what is the process of teaching art the process of teaching art is first that you have to undergo your own findings uh you have to readjust and uh, rethink and uh, uh, your own findings when when you were studying as a young because we somehow you're always hopefully progressing right 
but in the beginning, you are setting up what is important, uh, your learnings, your findings uh, in in your artwork and uh, in your judgmental uh, approach to art. When you st then you're a free artist, and for some years you're just with yourself, maybe some friends, maybe the public uh, medias, whatever. But then when you suddenly have to uh, talk to young people, young students, young souls, young beautiful souls actually, then you, um, you have to find again the speech, the language uh, about that. So you have to, un you, I remember that when I started 12 years back, all my findings, all what I trying to, to tell the students, I have to approve again. So I did paintings in my studio um, just to check if that what I'm telling them is true or not. <laughs> it was a good time, actually. So you had to become a student all over I, again. Exactly. I, I studied again. I studied all what I what I what I trying to to um, to pass on. I studied it myself again, and that was a good time because a lot of things were. Uh, I find this. I have found the same solutions. And some things, it widened again the consciousness. So I learned actually a lot through this. So to a young person uh, thinking about a career in art and, uh, you know, you, you are exposed to these people all the time who are exploring a career in art, a lot of people feel that they don't have the technical skill, they cannot draw very well. How important is it to have the technical skill or, and the passion? Or is it more important to have a passion to just create something you need the passion without passion no skill even the highest skill will not help you to become a good artist it's very clear um, skill will come naturally I mean I would even say some people who have a little lack in skill like color finding or drawing even um, they work harder and these people with a lot of skills you know they are a little bit um, uh, they have a easy beginning and that's not so I think it's not so helpful to to go deeper into it and to study hard and to to um, actually also overcome difficulties problems because there will be always something which is you know uh, you you don't know how to to paint hands that they look like or that they are actually even if they have only three fingers that they somehow working like hands should you know it's not about realism I'm not talking not at all about this realistic painting mm -hmm. but there's a kind of logic in everything the, each painting has a kind of indoor uh, logic so um, there's always something to to uh, overcome and to where you have to become better and you have to check very clearly uh, what you want and maybe after some time the painting starts to talk to you what the painting wants from you and this is also challenging <laughs> <laughs> so over the past few years Christian you've been involved also with the Inner Peace Museum here in Kana Shantivanam which is a big project it's an ongoing project it's something that's um, continuing how did that come about? How did uh, your involvement there come about? Uh, yeah, this was in Christmas 2018. We, I have been here with my family <clears throat> for the Christmas holidays and um, somebody approached me and said, you know, uh, we were going to have a uh, inner peace museum and we are looking for artists to collaborate. Uh, won't you do anything here? And I immediately had this idea, yeah, but I would like to bring my students here. <laughs> because we were already doing some meditation every week in the uh, university. I w we have this weekly sessions of meditation with the students. <clears throat> and I felt this is a, would be a good, a really good uh, project. And uh, then actually this was 2018 Christmas and over the year uh, we followed up this idea. The people in charge, Mina, Mrs. Minasai and others, we followed up this idea and we got some sponsorship from and the co kind of collaboration between the city of Dresden, uh, the University of Fine Arts in Dresden and uh, the community Kanashanti Vanam. So we, we 
had this collaboration and brought 15 students here to do uh, the first um, project in, I think, November 2019. Yeah. 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 It was really great. Yeah. I was here at that time, in fact. And uh, how, how, what was the students' response to it? I mean, it, it's, uh, you mentioned your own first trip to India, which was a shock, you know. So what was it like for the students? Because I'm thinking for them also, many of them, it must have been their first trip to India. Yeah, for nearly all of them, except maybe one or two. Um, I think it was not so much a shock because they landed here in Kana Shantivanam. And Kana Shantivanam is a particular place. I mean, it is... It is something like a, a, a promise for, for a life where you be in tune with nature among human beings of different backgrounds and different cultures who are really brothers and sisters equally and where you have the chance to, to develop your, your, your personal life in all uh, aspects and at the same time dive deep into your spirituality if you if you're really interested so for the i, be, I believe for the students it was not so much a shock mm -hmm. because when i landed it was quite rural in the beginning and here they were from the airport coming here to Kana Shantivanam. they had the experience of india the india uh, which the West know, knows mainly through the medias, when they were going for one day to Hyderabad or to some places around, and they enjoyed it also. But they all enjoyed it in the evening to be back here. So they know uh, the, the, let's say, the, the challenges of, of India, and particularly for those with this Eurocentric point mm -hmm. of view who think... Yes, how we are living, this is the right way to live. And which is, and they maybe, I hope, I, hope, I really hope they experience that it's just a possibility and maybe not even the best possibility. It's just a way. And um, I think they all, when they came back, they had the same experience that I had. And the real uh, cultural shock or clash, you say, I think, no? Mm -hmm. Cultural yeah, yeah. clash. I had when I came back to Europe because it was still winter, no leaf. I mean, no leaves on the trees, gray, brown colors, uh, nobody on the street. You really feel lonely. <laughs> <laughs> so the real shock is coming when you are going back to, to Europe. And I think the some of the students really felt it the same yeah. way. Yeah, you mentioned uh, this word lonely. Mm. I think it kind of uh, is... Uh, can, can be used to kind of define differences between the West and the East because uh, the West is pretty much a singular process. The individual is at the center of the yes. process yeah. and most certainly the artistic process, you know, but here you have 15 students and you are working together, not individually. True. How did that work? How did the conceptualization of the Inner Peace Museum, what you're going to do, you know, what you're going to paint, what mural you're going to do. How did that work? Was there was there friction? Was it easy to handle? Because there's no one artist who is True. putting their name to that. Yeah. Uh, well, this is, this is, uh, this was a challenge, of course, uh, because exactly as you said, the West has this God of individualism. And in this, we lost, the, I mean, we lost the connection to the next, to the other person. And, <clears throat> And this uh, idea uh, that we are coming here and working together and bringing something to the point, it was there in one sense, um, but the experience was lacking. So the, the idea was there and uh, the concept somehow was there, but then the, the practical experience was completely lacking. And um, this is one part, and the other part is language. I mean, not I'm not speaking about English or whatever, but... Um, <clears throat> In India, what we have experienced is that the, um, the, to express the individual freedom on one hand is not so much important as to express a meaning, 
which the community will understand. So <clears throat> in Europe, it doesn't matter if the uh, community d do understand what, what is the message. Or you have somebody who is going to explain it, like a curator or something like <laughs> sure, this. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but normally the, 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 the individual expression is more important uh, than the uh, message, which is somehow uh, important. And here we, the students learned that, for instance, everything has meaning. You cannot use just yellow because you like yellow. Yellow has a meaning, particularly in a spiritual sense, but on, in the religious and the cultural sense, in all senses, actually. In all mean, I mean, in all levels, and um, or you cannot just paint one flower. It should be a particular flower or a particular <laughs> bird. Yeah. So all this is important, I think, to learn and to see and to understand, and uh, and somehow it brings you back to um, the also what we have lost in Europe, because some not decades but centuries back we had the same thing. You couldn't paint just a white lily. It has a meaning, a particular meaning for Mother Mary, for instance, mm -hmm. or innocence. And so the beauty of meaning uh, is a little bit lost. And what I experienced when I'm talking to some directors of museums in Europe, for instance, they a little bit they they are missing. Yeah, uh, that somebody is reeling there who's saying I mean this <laughs> <laughs> in fact uh, I have a friend who's studying uh, film yeah. and uh, script writing particularly mm. and he's studying it in uh, LA and he was telling me that uh, in his entire class he is known as the narrative guy because he's the only guy who has a narrative going through in the traditional way with a start and an end mm. whereas everybody else is experimenting with a lack of narrative lack of yes. meaning lack of you content. know very uh, there's an obscurity and obfuscation yeah. to the whole uh, content actually mm. so uh, yeah which has gone to an extreme i suppose in modern times you know that yeah but there's <clears throat> it's very interesting because also what 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 we have now in in western art this idea of collectives you know, mm -hmm. uh, that artists are putting together and working together as a collective, a collective a group. And uh, th sometimes they're going, s or mostly they're going so far that there's no, uh, there's a kind of anonymity. Unknown anonymity, yeah. Anonymity yeah. in the group. So when they're doing paintings, for, they're doing conceptual art, uh, different mm -hmm. uh, performances, but also paintings sometimes. So they, um, there is a kind of understanding that this artist ego you were yes, yes, mentioning yes. this yes. uh thing and um it is more political for now but my feeling is that there is a like a like a growing consciousness that this is boring mm. simple boring and it's coming to a certain end this uh, this artist's ego or this idea to express mm. and to this um strong expression of something which is maybe nothing and there's a kind of search for um, understanding that we are very close and that we actually we are all one mm. beauty be very beautiful unique expressions of this oneness so mm. everybody is unique but in the end we are all one it's very interesting very interesting. But maybe in India, we are learning the other way right now. We are learning to be more individual. <laughs> because I, so I guess it's cyclical. It has one goes through the. Yeah, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe this deep uh, feeling of togetherness and um, being one mm -hmm. is so rooted here in India that you won't make the same mistakes like in Europe or in the West. Well, that only the future will tell. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but also uh, nowadays there is, um, of course, the NFT thing. You know, you, uh, you know about NFTs and digital scarcity. Yeah. What is your view on that? <laughs> I have no view on that, actually. <laughs> I know it's there. I have seen my daughter is working on the iPad and it looks beautifully. I tried it also one afternoon. It's mm. it's very enchanting and you yes. can lose yourself into it like in everything which is enchanting. And uh, it's okay. I like it. But it's... Um, 
it's what I'm missing, what I would miss personally. I'm not saying that it's not good. It can be really good. And nowadays you can also, I don't know how would you, how would you express it in English, but you can lock it that it's unique. You have only one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the, it's a non-fungible token. That means it's just one and yes. one person can own it, you know, like, yes. a, like an artwork. Yeah, like an artwork. So art has ever found, always found different ways of expression. So this mm. is, it's okay. It's fine. What I would personally miss is, um, and that's a bit funny that I miss it, but is the the uh, the sensual quality uh, of color, of material, is, is it right? Texture, yeah. Uh, the texture, and uh, sometimes you have to put your finger into the color and uh, blur something. And and uh, this very, um, I don't know, um, feeling of sure. producing the art, I would miss. Sure, sure. In fact, now there are um, artificial Maybe. intelligence programs. Yes, you were saying. No, please. <laughs> No, no, please go ahead. No, I'm just saying, maybe not so much in watching it, but mm -hmm. maybe in doing it, I would miss it. Yeah. Sorry, but no. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, talking about these artificial intelligence programs. There's a program called DALI, I think. It's named after the surrealist Artists, painter, yeah. where you can actually uh, just give it a prompt that I want, uh, please paint a pink elephant sitting in a large hall in so and so and it will do it in five seconds yeah and you can also tell it the style you want it and you want an oil painting on an acrylic painting and it just uh, so it's uh, you know I don't know what the future holds I don't know what uh, for the art world also it's a time of uh, you know interesting times so much change yeah I mean um David Hockney, you might Yes, know. of yeah, course. Yeah. He started to do the... He brought very famous... He was creating very famous iPad paintings. And uh, they look nice. Uh, I've seen an exhibition with huge printouts. And the moment you print them out, they look not so nice. <laughs> because it's just a print. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's also the way how you present it, maybe. Yeah. I think Damien Hurst is doing something called currency, right? Where he's actually printing out these um, these things with dots on them and they, they're they going to work like currency. <laughs> I mean, he's yes. just been. But anyway, the interesting stuff happening all over. Yeah. But the, what you were speaking about collectives, that is that is something maybe that will be interesting to see how it evolves. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. And this is what, what we are talking also with the students because mm -hmm. they have also, there's a high level of empathy on mm -hmm. the new generation. And um, they have a, they have also a kind of um, resistance against this ego pushing uh, um, attitude, mm. artist attitude. It's somehow over. It's like mm. an old-fashioned uh, <laughs> uh, way of of you know behavior. So they are much more uh, empathetic, uh, much more looking for the other. And uh, this movement of collectives is uh, mirroring a bit. Mm this new uh, new um, consciousness, maybe. Mm. Um, recently, you were involved in the, uh, you know, constructing the Lalaji space and yeah. students as well from yeah. Dresden were uh, working on Lalaji space, which Lalaji, of course, was the person who found this technique of heartfulness or rediscovered this technique yeah. after it had been lost. Pranahuti. Mm. Pranahuti. So... Um, how difficult was it to connect to somebody who's, of course, no, uh, you know, left the physical body almost a hundred years ago? For the students, yeah, for the students. How do you how do you get to the essence of that? Even even for you as personally, how how did you how do you get to the essence of Lalaji? You read his books. What do, what what preparation do you do? Yeah, I I have read already his books and reread it of course and there's a new edition which I jumped into reading the letters and um, um, I maybe rediscovered or discovered personally his sweetness of heart and expression he was so loving and, and uh, you know there are just two three photos 
And when I started Heartfulness Meditation, there was only one photo, and he mm -hmm. looked very uh, stern. Yes, stern. Yeah. So uh, this um, loving and 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 warm side uh, of of his character, which is transmitted by the letters, for instance, uh, his writings. Uh, this is something beautiful. And in this sense, there was a kind of uh, rediscovery of this beauty when I started to prepare again for this exhibition. For the students, um, actually, we were preparing something to totally different mm -hmm. for a month. <laughs> we were starting since maybe August or September in, in Dresden, in Germany, we were preparing for the world religions <laughs> because there should be an exhibition of the world religions. Yeah, that was the original plan, to have the, the world. Plan. Yeah. So we worked for this for, for five you months. You were conceptualizing that. Yeah, we were conceptualizing this. We, we invited, uh, uh, in, still in Germany, when we had our meditations, after the meditations or before, we invited Buddhist monks, we invited, you know, uh, representatives of the various religions. When we came here, we had the surprise that we had to finish this work for the Sladagy space. But I was really um, happy to see the students jumping into this uh, new task. Of course, some had a little bit more difficulty, but others were just uh, going to uh, into this um, uh, new challenge. And what I observed and what really is ha has been nice to see that then the students were discussing about lalaji <laughs> 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 so they he was very much alive i mean he mm. he was very much vividly uh, present while the students were working on the paintings two were doing some portraits other were doing painting his hands and the prayerful um gesture um others were creating, trying to create his home uh, uh um in the three-dimensional painting. So it was beautiful to see how everybody tried to get a connection to him and got a connection to him. And I was sorry. No, and uh, that connection moved a lot of people. The people broke down in the space when they saw the exhibition. Yeah, I have no idea. I've never been there <laughs> while there were people coming and speaking. Uh, we were still continued to work upstairs in the studio. Mm -hmm. But I heard that a lot of people are happy with this exhibition and felt something. Yes, yes, most certainly. So, Christian, you described uh, how uh, after the, the, you know, the, in your second sitting, you experienced that stage beyond duality where there was, the first sitting was all light and the second sitting seemed to be kind of dark until it reached a place where it was beyond light and dark. Um then it was over. Then it was over. <laughs> but how how do how do you move on from that? You've already moved beyond dualities. No. Does that experience keep repeating, or is that what is the onward journey? What has it been? I, it's difficult to say. I would say. Um, You're gaining and losing. You're losing more and more unnecessary things, uh, ideas, uh, concepts. Um, a lot of things are gone, which have been very important maybe for some time. That's nice. It's getting mm. lighter and lighter. <laughs> but I think it's not, it's, I mean, we are all on the way, right? Mm -hmm. So I would never, I would not never be able to say that uh what is what is ahead <laughs> no it's you mentioned how you wanted to repeat your first sitting yeah when you came to your second sitting yeah. and uh once you had your second sitting one would be tempted to say okay now i've experienced it it's done i know it's beyond light and dark but is there a journey beyond beyond light and dark also? Well, I will see. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you can tell me. <laughs> I believe so. And uh, sometimes you, in deep meditations, you, you, you are there and you mm. feel it and you experience it, but it's so hard to put in words. I think we cannot put it in words because words, again, like art, is just a play without dualities. Mm. 
So the real thing we cannot express, like f true feelings we cannot express. We just humbly have to maybe inside close the eyes and just let it expand. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Christian. It's been an hour, oh. but it's flown by and we could go on talking. <laughs> thank you. But it's been wonderful your sharing. It's been so, uh, so lovely and from the heart. And thank you for doing this. We managed to get you two days before you leave Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually your heart which was calling. <laughs> thank you, Rudy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very kind of you, Christian. Thanks. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Kana Cast. Please follow and subscribe to Kana Cast on Spotify, YouTube and Instagram. Until next time. Woof woof.